So the next piece that's up on the Pottery Throwdown Challenge is a piece of pottery that was submitted by Emma Gross. Um, she says she thinks it looks cool in the middle section. Um, is also cool. Uh, I'll point out that it is a cylindrical object, much like a vase, but the middle section actually has these interesting waves. So depending upon how the original artist created that, oftentimes that's done just because the middle might be a little bit thinner and the pot is able to kind of be twisted to create that effect. So I'll see if I can give that a shot. Thanks, Emma, for submitting this. Here we go. So for this piece, I'm working with a little bit larger volume of clay. Well, not a little bit. I'm probably closer to about six pounds. I kind of opened up a fresh bag of clay and kind of cut it in half. Fresh bag of clay is 25 pounds. I cut it in half and then that piece I cut in half yet again. So this is probably close to six pounds. So it's a different clay body. Uh, this is called WS5. It has similar characteristics as the BMX5 with Grog that I was using. The big difference is, is this is fresh clay as opposed to recycled and pug clay. So its consistency and uniformity are a little bit more intact. It has a nice um, formulation to it that has grog in it. So it's a pretty versatile clay body to use as hand building goes and wheel throwing goes. Although it starts off gray it actually fires to a slightly off-white color, so it's kind of nice that way too. So because I'm making, based upon the image that Emma submitted, I'm going to be making a piece that's somewhat taller so still cylindrical but taller. So I'm not going to center this piece of clay down to the bat as much as I might if I were making a bowl or something that's shorter and wider. So I don't want to, I don't need to take this down that far because I just got to bring it back up again. So. so with a larger piece of clay like this, I'm going to change up a little bit of change up my technique of what I'm doing to hold this out. So here with a little larger piece of clay I'm going to incorporate my thumbs and as long as everything is stationary, as long as my thumbs aren't wobbling, being pulled side to side, I can create that opening and start pushing my thumbs downward in the middle to create the opening for my pot. Steadier that I can hold, and I'm going to switch over. The steadier that I can hold with my hands, with my arms, you know, so I keep everything tucked in nicely. The more rigidity I can maintain, the better chance I have of achieving the results that I desire. I think you can relate that concept to a lot of things in life. So as I work that, I'm working to open that inside wall. 
working to keep the outside wall straight and centered. Getting the inside opening to what I want it to be. slow it down a little bit and I'm going to start making some poles upward. So with a little bit larger amount of clay I tend to change up my pulling technique instead of just fingers I'll actually use more of my knuckle. Pull. I'm going to work to compress that rim and get that evened out a little bit. If I have some unevenness in the wall, I hope to pull that to the top. So as I make these poles, to move the clay upward. It's important to understand and keep in mind that with every pull, the outside hand is lower than the inside hand. And that simply, simply exists because of the thickness of the clay that's at the bottom, it forces my fingers to be that much higher up than the clay that's out here because my fingers can touch the bat. So once I start pulling clay upward, my inside hand has to be above my outside hand. And I should be able to kind of feel that in a groove as I can right now when I can put my hands together. Finish that pull. Right, we're getting a little taller, so I'm going to open that up a little bit. There we go. So, I'm going to bring this wall back in a little bit. This technique that I'm doing now generally is called collaring kind of take things from the shoulder and bring it back in. But I'm not so much collaring because everything right now is about the same diameter. But that's the generalization of the technique. It's just to move the wall inward and upward. Okay, so. so I have a little bit of unevenness there at the top. So I want to take my needle tool and see if I can trim off and get rid of some of that unevenness. And now you see that my rim is now flat. Okay.
really, really important part of this process is to maintain the same speed as you move upward. And as much as I want to make sure that my left hand is higher than my right hand, I also want to maintain the same speed. In my instructional videos that I also have on YouTube, I also interject the terms pace and rhythm and cadence. So depending upon what you're into, musically, you're dealing with rhythm. Okay, if you're running, you're dealing with pace. And if you're into cycling, cycling, bicycle riding, you are familiar with the term cadence. And cadence in that case is that you're pedaling at the same rate, the same speed, the same RPM, no matter if you're going uphill or downhill. And it just helps you with continuity of movement. Kind of like rhythm, you know, for those of you that are musicians, you understand rhythm. And if you're running, especially at a distance, you want to maintain the same pace. The longer you can maintain the right pace, the further you can go. You can burn out before you're done. So this piece is probably a neighborhood of, I have roughly a nine inch hand span. So a little over nine inches. So this pot's about 10 inches tall at the moment. So before I start working now, I'm at a point where I'm okay with the, the size and the shape overall. I am satisfied with the thickness of the wall at this point. So now I'm going to start giving consideration to how am I going to go about creating the piece that Emma submitted. So let's just revisit a little bit. Okay, down at the bottom, the bottom of the pot is flared out a little bit. So what I'm going to do is at the wall down here, I'm going to bring that in a little bit. So you start to give that some inward curvature. The piece here in the middle is kind of a folded piece. So I'm going to do what I can to attempt that. And then the top happens to be a little bit narrower. If I could actually measure the base and measure the top, I would see that the top opening is a little bit narrower than the base is. So I'm going to work on going through each of those steps. So I'm going to bring the top in a little bit because I'm okay with my arm going inside and I don't want to have to alter that, worry about altering the top after I'm done with the middle because that could prove to be disastrous. So just by compressing my hands gently around and my hands are wet as I do this but you see that I'm kind of going from the middle as I squeeze gently inward I move upward and you can see how this now is starting to take on a tapered shape okay So that looks pretty good. 
So now I want to work on kind of that bottom. I'm actually going to reach inside and I'm gently going to thin out. It's going to help me create that twist in the middle is to have the wall a little bit thinner. Okay, so the bottom is shaped inward, so that's just going to be squeezing inward. sure that I can mop up. I have a little bit of water inside at the bottom. So before I kind of call it a finished shape, I want to make sure that I'm mopping up what might be inside. If the clay on the inside bottom is wet, that just complicates what it is I'm trying to accomplish here. Okay, so now I gotta try and create that twist in there. And this isn't something that's generally, you know, done, if you will, intentionally. Oftentimes that twist it happens accidentally. So I'm just trying a variable technique here see if I can get get my piece of clay to do that. So I don't know that it's quite what we're looking for with that whole thing. It's not quite what I'm imagining actually exists in the piece to start with. So 
but it's a fairly interesting texture. The twist that oftentimes happens, it happens accidentally because the amount of clay, there's a difference in the weight. Okay, well, we're still recording. So the last piece here, so I think I'm going to leave it with the texture as it is there. And um, the upper shape is a little bit different than what it is in the piece that was submitted by Emma. Um, but I'm pretty pleased with the overall shape. And I think the, the neckline of the piece, the way I've shaped it here, I think the neckline adds nicely to what we have. I think the, the other piece, the piece submitted by Emma, I think it has a lot of visual interest. And short of having the accidental collapse that results because the clay in the middle is thinner, okay, and the clay at top is thicker and thus heavier. So it's kind of like having a really big upper body and a little skinny waist is you, you're out of proportion. And what happens is that weight bears down. And when you work with the clay, it sometimes twists. So those are, um, they're, they're accidental happenings. It's not very often that somebody intends to do something like that. So I'm going to kind of call this one good as it is. What I am going to do is I'm going to use uh, a black rubber rib. I'm also going to use my wood modeling tool. I'm going to clean up that bottom edge a little bit. And I'm going to use my rubber rib just to clean up the outside. Tighten up the clay a little bit. Get rid of, so to speak, the, the sponge marks. And there's a bunch of different tools that a person can use for something like this. I was messing around at home. I took an old magnet. The magnets are flexible. So I thought, well, let me just try a magnet and see. I cut it into a couple of pieces that I could cut some different shapes out of. And because the magnet is flexible, I like it a lot gives me some versatility, allows me to work in ways that I'm more comfortable working. In the same regard, because it is soft, because it's flexible, it allows the potter to work a little more effectively with the clay, with the form. because I have a rim that's a little bit thicker, I'm going to try, I've created a, just a cheapo tool. It's a plastic tie off of a bread bag. And I'm going to try that on the rim.
just to kind of compress that rim and clean off a little excess clay. See how well that works. So, I think from that, I think we've got a, a nice piece here. Thanks, Emma, for submitting it. I hope you're happy with what I produced.